Hey, everybody, welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Great to have you with us on this Friday. A lot of breaking news to get to today, including some fast-moving developments at the White House, where President Trump is meeting with the vice premier of China in the midst of that trade war. We will have those developments coming up. But first, some breaking news from the Pentagon. One day after President Trump talked about the Middle East as a quagmire, vowing to pull American troops out of that region, today the Pentagon announced it is sending back thousands of more American American troops to Saudi Arabia, one of the biggest deployments in years. Here's the defense secretary making that announcement. Iran's attempts to use terror, intimidation, and military force to advance its interests are inconsistent with international norms. Saudi Arabia is a longstanding security partner in the Middle East and has asked for additional support to supplement their own defenses and defend the international rules-based order. And that announcement from Defense Secretary Esper stands in stark contrast to what President Trump just yesterday in the Oval Office had to say about troops in the Middle East, saying countries there should defend themselves. The worst mistake that the United States has ever made, in my opinion, was going into the Middle East. It's a quagmire. We are up to close to $8 trillion, and we're bringing our folks back home. We have great, talented military. We're bringing them back home. Our military has never been stronger, but we're now acting as police. We're, we're policing areas. We're doing jobs that other countries should be doing. Let's go right to the Pentagon and our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, uh, who has been doing reporting on this all afternoon. Louis, um, help us understand what's at play here. Put this deployment in context. This is several thousand Americans uh, one of the biggest deployments of troops in years. No, you're right, Devin. This goes back to Saudi Arabia, the big attack that Iran, Iran uh, undertook with drones and with missiles about a month ago on those Saudi oil facilities. At that time, the United States, in response, sent 200 troops along with Patriot Battery and some radars, and that was about it. They were looking for international partners. What Now, what do we have? We have 2,800 more troops that are either being extended or being sent on new deployments to Saudi Arabia uh, to assist uh, it, as part of the deterrence against future Iranian aggression against Saudi Arabia. We're talking about two new fighter squadrons. We're talking about uh, an Air Force expeditionary wing, two new Patriot batteries. Um, a FAD system, that's what a terminal high altitude area stands for. Um, and, and, and then also some more AWACS planes. Those are those aircraft that have radars on them that can detect incoming <clears throat> attacks at long distance. This is something that the United States has had to balance the threat from Iran along with the new threat, the new concern, this crisis situation that we have there along the Turkish and Syrian border. Uh, the president has expressed a desire to pull out American troops to ensure that uh, American troops are safe in that area uh, where Turkey has undertaken this incursion. We know that they removed a very small number of American troops, about 50 or so, uh, who were at two observation posts along the border. Uh, but there are a thousand other personnel that in, inside Syria. Uh, they are still there. We heard that from the Secretary of uh, Defense and from General Mark Milley today at a Pentagon briefing, uh, that they are there uh, to still partner with their Kurdish uh, uh, forces, um, though they are not undertaking uh, ISIS missions at this point. Um, so uh, it's the fine balancing act, Devin. You've got this situation where you've got this crisis uh, uh, already that's developing in the past week on, on that border, and you also have to deal with the enduring threat uh, from posed by Iran to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but, Louis, help us try to understand the apparent contradiction here in the Trump policy. I wonder um, what analysis you can lend and perhaps what insights from officials at the Pentagon you might be able to share. I mean, again, um, just this week we began the week hearing from the president pulling those 50 troops uh, off the front lines. He said, we've got to bring them home. And yet here now we have thousands of troops going to a country that the president himself has talked about being a very rich country, a country that should provide its own defense, um, talks about about countries in the region facing a lot of these problems on their own. What's really at play here? Now, you're right, Devin. The juxtaposition just is very awkward uh, because he's talking about a quagmire in the Middle East. We should have never been there. Uh, he's talking about a broader pullout, potentially, of U.S. forces from inside Syria. Um, but he's also, as we know, been very strong against Iran in the campaign uh, when it, in his early mm -hmm. years of his presidency. That's why he pulled out of that uh, nuclear deal with Iran. And yet Iran has been strong. They've, they undertook this—they've uh, been brazen in their attacks, actually. I mean, this uh, air attack that they 
they conducted on these Saudi oil facilities, um, something that we've never seen before. And so the United States had to bolster its defenses because it's not just the Saudis, it's American interests in that region that they have to protect. And so that's why they're sending these additional resources. You can also expect that that 200 forces and that Patriot battery that you sent was probably, in the Saudis' eyes, not enough. And so this is something that they, they've been planning for a while now. And finally, Louis, real quick, as these thousands of troops head over there to Saudi Arabia, and our thoughts are with them and their families as this deployment gets underway, um, you're also hearing again from those Kurds in Syria. We've talked about them this week, right. those American allies in fighting ISIS. Is this sort of a slap in the face to them as, as the president pulls them away from one conflict and sends them over in a different place? No, you're exactly right, Devin. They feel abandoned. I mean, you heard Secretary of Defense uh, Esper today say, we have not abandoned them. But there's no escaping that that's the sense that they have. They're on the ground. They're seeing this. Uh, yes, there are American partners with them elsewhere inside uh, of Syria. But they know that inside this area where Turkey has been attacking, that those Americans are not going to be there to assist them. They can't rely on American airstrikes to push back against NATO. And don't forget, NATO is a U.S. ally. I mean, U.S. Uh, Turkey is a U.S. NATO ally for those, since 1948. Um, you, the United States can't attack uh, Turkey. Um, and so this is just a very difficult situation for the Kurds. Obviously, they feel terrible about it in the sense that they want to push back. They want, they're urging the president, um, uh, President Trump, they've just written a letter to him uh, urging him to stop Turkey's incursion mm -hmm. in there, to do what it can. Uh, but their hands are tied. Um, and it, it's really hard to escape the fact that this is a very tough situation for the Kurds. And also for American troops that have been serving with them, uh, we have these anecdotes about American soldiers who feel terrible that they can't do anything to help their partners uh, in this situation because they know that the Kurds have spent, uh, that a lot of Kurdish uh, blood, men and women, fighters have died uh, in the fight against ISIS. And now at this difficult time, uh, Turkey is just, could f force themselves upon them in a very strong way. And we don't know how this is going to end up for the Kurds. A significant development this week, Louis, and of course, again, uh, a major headline this afternoon, thousands of American troops to Saudi Arabia, one of the largest deployments in years. Thanks, Louis. Hope you have a great weekend. Appreciate your reporting. Uh, turning back to Capitol Hill now and a setback for President Trump in his effort to keep his financial records secret uh, from the eyes of Congress. A con uh, federal appeals court today ruled that the president's accounting firm, Mazars, must comply with a congressional subpoena asking for those documents or senior editorial producer. John Santucci is here. He's been all over the case. John, the documents that are in question here cover the period both before, during, and, uh, and during the tr Trump presidency. What do these things show? Yeah, so this is the firm that the president and his family have used for decades to actually do their tax returns and their other financial documents. So what Congress is hoping to get a look at from all of the different ways they've been trying is some sort of information on Donald Trump's financials. Now, this was a case that originally went before a district court judge earlier earlier this year. This was regarding the subpoena from the House Oversight Committee for those records. The district court said, well, you have to turn this over, have to comply. Trump world goes and appeals. They just lost this appeal. But what this means today, Devin, is that really the last road left for the Trump team here is, frankly, the Supreme Court. So that's going to be a question if the court takes it up and then where they're And they're planning to go. appeal to the Supreme yes, Court. Yes, what we are hearing is one of the options they are considering. And let's take a look at what the appeals court ruled today. It was a two-to-one decision mm -hmm. on the federal uh, court of appeals here in the district. This is what the judge uh, put in uh, their opinion. It was actually a two-judge opinion here. The subpoena from Congress, uh, this court says, is a valid exercise of information important to determining the fitness of legislation to address potential problems within the executive branch and the electoral system. It does not seek to determine the president's fitness for office. It goes on to conclude that the subpoena issued by the committee, the House Oversight Committee to Mazars, is valid and enforceable. We affirm the district court's judgment uh, in favor of the committee. John, it's interesting because at issue here is why they need this information. Mm -hmm. The Trump people were saying this is an unlawful inquiry by Congress to seek his financial details just to hurt the president. Yeah. But the committee's been arguing that they actually want to see this because they want to pass laws 
to better hold presidents to account uh, for conflicts of interest. Yeah, and it also has a big deal to do with what Donald Trump, frankly, has been saying for the last five years. He's been a <laughs> candidate that I've been under audit, and I don't know why that is. So the committee said, hey, we should try to Let's figure find that out. out. So we talk about a foot and mouth moment for him. But, you know, listen, this is not the only avenue um, that we are seeing regards to efforts to get the president's tax returns. So we've ended the week here with this ruling. Remember, we began the week with that damning ruling in New York from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that is seeking records of the president's financials as it relates to the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. So there are multiple, multiple tracks underway to get a glimpse at what Donald Trump has done regarding his financials for decades. Remember, he is the first president in 40 years, Devin, that we have not, not seen a shred tax of tax and returns. And we did hear from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi today calling this a victory. Uh, it is a big moment for Democrats yeah. uh, to see this from the Federal Court of Appeals. Here's what the Speaker said. Uh, the Speaker said in a statement after this ruling that the subpoena is a valid exercise of the information important to determining the fitness of legislation to address potential problems within the electoral branch, electoral system. We're not trying to determine the president's fitness for office. A little bit yeah. coy there. Yeah, uh, a little I mean, obviously, there. They're, they are conducting this impeachment inquiry, sure. and this would help them, right? Absolutely. It would give ammunition. Remember, we have six different committees in the House going here. Two of those relate to financials, the House Financial Services Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. Remember, they're the ones that write the tax code. So that does give a lot of fuel to Democrats' fire to try to go into the president. The one other thing that I do think is interesting from today's ruling from the appellate court is where they say that it is the founders view when they created the Constitution that there was a checks and balances system here so they were very defiant in supporting the House's efforts score one for Congress and their subpoena power mm -hmm. over the White House John Santucci thanks so much Thank speaking you. of subpoenas uh, the White House has faced a mountain of subpoenas this week for documents and testimony from a number of officials uh, involved with the president's policy toward Ukraine Ukraine. Today, one of those officials that Congress has sought to speak with, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie uh, Yovanovitch, a career civil servant, actually defied White House orders not to appear and did go to, uh, to Capitol Hill to give a deposition. That's where Catherine Falders has been staked out all day uh, to, to learn what uh, Yovanovitch is telling the committee. Catherine, uh, a lot of people uh, closely watching this. She was a central figure in, in this phone call in the president's effort uh, to, uh, to investigate Joe Biden. Yes, yeah, she was, Devin. And I think what's significant, uh, what you touched on uh, about this testimony, the, the former ambassador uh, to Ukraine, she is actually here under subpoena. The White House, the State Department, at the direction of the White House, tried to block uh, her testimony again. So uh, the committee subpoenaed her, and therefore she's uh, showed up here today. Uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times though, have obtained uh, some have obtained her opening statement, and, and I think perhaps the most damning thing, Devin, that we've learned uh, from this statement is that she said that her superiors decided to remove her based on, and I'm quoting here from this statement, unfounded and false claims by people with clearly questionable motives. And in her statement, she takes clear aim uh, at the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, Devin. All right, and Catherine, you know, a lot of people looking at this know that this figure, uh, Yovanovitch, is someone who um, isn't beholden to the president. She wasn't an appointee, served uh, at the uh, pleasure of the president, could certainly be fired, according to White House officials, for really any reason. Um, but it, 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 really, to underscore this, she was raising concerns about what Rudy Giuliani was doing over there, and that's why Democrats really want to hear from her. Exactly. And I think Giuliani obviously is a central <clears throat> figure here. You saw two of his um, associates. Uh, they were arrested uh, yesterday, two days ago. Uh, so they want to hear from her and what, what she specifically knows about those two, about Giuliani's uh, business dealings, Devin, uh, and, and how really he is all caught up in this controversy of Ukraine and withholding the aid. And really uh, what's significant here, too, is that we've also learned that uh, Giuliani, uh, from our colleagues in New York, is now uh, under investigation as well for his uh, relationship with these two central figures who were arrested two days ago.
So uh, obviously Giuliani going to get a, a lot of scrutiny after those two arrests uh, right. and indictments yesterday. Uh, he's been keeping quiet. Catherine, thank you. Stand by. I want to bring in Ben Siegel. He's over at the White House for us. He's tracking the White House reaction to all of this. And Ben, uh, let's zoom out to big picture here. This is the second week of the House Democrats impeachment inquiry. Uh, Congress actually comes back officially next week. They're expecting to really up the ante with these investigations, these subpoenas. Uh, what are you hearing from the White House about what they may or may not comply with next week when the House is back in session? Well, the White House now is in an interesting position after Ambassador Yovanovitch appeared on the Hill today. Uh, we think she's perhaps the first um, Trump administration official uh, to go and talk to investigators under subpoena in defiance of the White House. And this potentially gives cover for a whole number of other career officials who Democrats want to speak to uh, to go up to Capitol Hill and tell uh, their account of what happened between the Trump administration in Ukraine and uh, what Rudy Giuliani was doing uh, in a way that could potentially uh, be harmful to this president's defense and this, this administration. Defense. So, uh, in one sense, the walls are sort of closing in here on the White House as they've really declared an all out war of stonewalling against Congress, but they're seeing little by little potentially some cracks in that defense uh, as things really get going with the impeachment. Cracks in the defense. And Catherine Falders, uh, real quickly back to you. Republicans now will come back to Washington next week facing uh, a very simple question that a number of them have had difficulty answering, and that is. Quite simple. Do you think the president's conduct asking foreign countries to investigate his rival is appropriate? We saw again overnight that a number of Republicans have been pressed on that. They don't have an answer yet. Yeah, Devin, and I think that's a significant point because Republicans, uh, whether they're lawmakers or sources that I've spoken to behind the scenes, uh, do have serious concerns uh, with the president's conduct, with uh, what he said on this call with Ukraine. It raises questions, of course, uh, about other phone calls and what he said. Uh, and I do think publicly you are seeing a bit of a shift. Um, but but I do think once Republicans come back next week, they are facing tough questions. And look, uh, many have said to me that the president can continues to talk about this. He's making it worse uh, when his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, is on TV. Some Republicans have said to me that that's good for the Democrats because it gives them five or ten different investigative leads. So when they come back, Devin, they have some questions to answer, especially that the president uh, has been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Thanks, Catherine. As we close out this second week, we're also closely tracking public opinion uh, on this impeachment inquiry. The trend lines are going upward in terms of American support for this. Our friends at 538 have an impeachment tracker up on the website. Uh, and Nathaniel Rakich is here uh, joining us on this Friday to talk a little bit about more uh, of what they are finding there. Uh, hey, Nathaniel, good to see you. Has I guess the big question yeah. I have is, do you think that uh, support for impeachment, we're now at about 50-odd percent in most public polls. We we've seen. Is that a ceiling or do you think there's actually room for that number to continue rising? No, you know, I think that there's, this is still pretty early in the story and that things are going to unfold, how they're going to unfold, and that could be good for Trump or it could be very bad for Trump. You know, you're seeing, of course, his approval rating and his disapproval rating have long been around, you know, 45 to 55 percent, so 55 percent disapproval rating. So it's certainly possible that all of those people who disapprove of him could come to support an impeachment, at least an impeachment inquiry. Um, so certainly it could go higher than the 49 percent that it's currently at in our tracker. And, and that tracker is tracking the inquiry, which is uh, an important distinction between uh, the inquiry and removal from office, which uh, well, I wanted to get your... <laughs> Hey, you're averaging both polls. Okay, important point. Um, let's talk about that second point there, the removal of office. I've been struck, Nathaniel, by the Fox News poll, just a single one out this week, um, which actually showed majority support for not only impeachment of the president, but removal of the president from office. Um, how should we think about polls that look at not just the inquiry, but removal? Um, and, and were you surprised to see a Fox poll show that majority? So not specifically about Fox. So Fox, kind of despite its conservative um, reputation of the news network, its pollster operation is actually really highly excellent, straight down the line of the middle. It's run by one Democratic pollster, one Republican pollster working together. Um, so that um, poll number should be pretty accurate. But yeah, I was surprised that the 51 percent number, usually you're seeing numbers like, you know, in the 50s for the inquiry, as you mentioned. But to see support for removal above 50 percent, was pretty notable. I will say that's still kind of on the higher end of the polls that we're seeing. So it could be a leading indicator of things to come, or it could be an outlier. 
Right, Nathaniel Rake, it's great always to have you, uh, Nathaniel, on the show. Thanks so much for coming in on this Friday. Everybody check out their impeachment tracker uh, at 538.com. And finally, I just want to go back to Ben Siegel over at the White House because uh, as we close out this week, uh, it's been so busy on the news headlines front with impeachment, but it's going to get even busier next week when all these members of Congress come back, the president's in town, Ben. Um, give us sort of the lay of the land, uh, what week three of the impeachment probe will look like. What are you going to be watching uh, for the early part of the week. I think, again, a couple of things. It's important to see uh, what these other officials, uh, Democrats, uh, who have contacted and they want to speak to, what they end up doing uh, when the White House tells them not to not to cooperate with Democrats on the Hill, again, looking for some more cracks in that defense. And I think this will also be t a telling week next week uh, to see where Republicans are in the Senate. This is obviously President Trump's firewall, his defense against conviction of impeachment if the Democratic House uh, advances that later this year, which we uh, expect that they will be able to do uh, with their own votes. Uh, uh, only, only a handful of senators, uh, Republicans, both moderates and institutionalists there, uh, are the ones that can determine whether or not uh, a possible trial in the Senate uh happens quickly or if it, if it takes a long period of time, in which case uh, President Trump's fate could uh, be sort of left a little a little less secure than he'd probably like. So it'll be interesting to see where some of these Republicans are uh, when we get back. But, Devin, uh, it's also just important to point out that uh, we're not just facing impeachment right now. Uh, Washington is still sort of reeling uh, from the president's decision to pull American troops uh, out of Syria and Turkey. You know, Turkey is now invaded. There's talk of sanctions being passed uh, against Turkey on Capitol Hill this week from Republicans and Democrats. And the vice and the president is is, as we speak, meeting with the Chinese vice premier on trade. He's eager to get a deal there before uh, new tariffs kick in. Uh, so, you know, many of these things would be a lot for a president to take on uh, by themselves. But, again, we're in a busy time, as you said, in Washington, and they're all sort of converging together. So it'll be an even busier week uh, and fall uh, as we go on. All right, Ben, stand by. Thanks for that. Some news coming out of the White House. We will come back to you in just a second. I'll sort of thanks to Catherine Folders uh, up on Capitol Hill. Uh, uh, Catherine wasn't the only one on Capitol Hill today tracking those impeachment developments. Uh, a, a, climate change was also in the spotlight today. It's something that has bothered one Hollywood actor so much that she brought her, her cause to Congress today. This is 81-year-old uh, Jane Fonda, the Oscar legend. Uh, she was up on Capitol Hill today pro protesting not only the president, uh, but Republicans' policies on climate change. You see her there. She says Greta Thunberg and other young activists uh, have inspired her to take action. Uh, our deputy political director, Mary Alice Parks, was there today as she got arrested uh, and caught up with, uh, with, uh, with Jane Fonda and has had this conversation. I want to make a commitment to climate change. The, the student climate strikers have really inspired me to do more than I've been doing. And so I said, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to do something that, you know, it's not easy for me right now. But I'm moving here, and I'm going to be here through Thanksgiving and Christmas and sleet, rain, whatever it is. Every Friday at 11 o'clock in front of the Capitol, we're having an action. You know, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish student, she said, we have to behave like our house is on fire, because this is a crisis. Well, you've written quite a lot about how Greta has inspired you. I was reading one of your tweets where you said that uh, get out of your comfort zones, like you just said, stop acting like business as usual, behave like we're in a crisis. Are the kids really leading the adults on this one? Yeah, they are. I mean, they didn't have anything to do with getting us into this mess. And, uh, and they're saying, come on, you know, you're taking our future away from us. We need, we need you to support us. And so grandmas unite. I want to stand with them and raise up their, you know, their, their message. Um, th this is, this is serious. This, this is a real, this is a crisis unlike anything that has ever faced humankind. The reason that I'm here every Friday with Fire Drills Friday is because I think every single human being has to say, what can I do to put this in the front? I mean, look at everything. You know better than I do. Everything that's going on in the news. Well, we have to fight our way through that and find ways to get climate change in people's minds. They have to I mean, there's so many issues. Vote. There's so no, many no, issues. No, no, no. There's only one. There's one issue that will determine the survival of our species. Mm. This is not hyperbole. This is real. Was there a turning point for you on this issue? I mean, your passion well, is a, palpable. I've been, I've been a climate scientist for decades and decades, but it was Greta Thunberg, this little Swedish girl holding her sign every Friday in front of the Swedish parliament. That's why I've chosen Friday, too. And all the student strikers all over the world who have really risked a lot and given up a lot 
in order to say, wake up, old people. How come you're not standing with us? You've taken our future away. We have to lead the way. I mean, are we who we are? We are the United States of America. We have to lead the way. And if we do, they'll follow suit. All right, well, Jane Fonda, your passion on this issue, you're going to be here in D.C. for the next few months through the holidays. We'll be tracking all of your 11 work, 11 o'clock sure. every Friday morning. Come and get arrested with me or choose not to. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, our thanks to Mary Alice Parks there with actress Jane Fonda getting arrested on the Hill today. Uh, back to the White House now for some breaking news as President Trump concludes his meeting with Chinese Vice Premier uh, Li Hu. He's in the Oval Office. They were talking about this trade war that's been going on now for 15 months. Let's bring Ben, ben Siegel back into this. Uh, ben, this has been pinching American farmers, rattling American investors. Uh, but some good news just now from the president. He says they have reached a partial deal. That's right. The president, who loves, relishes the idea of being a deal maker on the world stage. He says they've started uh, the process of reaching a deal to avert these uh, billions of dollars in tariffs that were going to go into effect next week. Uh, and that's a good, this is a good headline for him, a good story for him. Uh, you know, he's coming back from this, uh, from a, a, a campaign rally in Minneapolis last night. And we hear this from time and time and again from inside the White House, from Republicans uh, on Capitol Hill and around the country. The president's strongest reelection argument uh, is the economy. So, uh, with this. This is something that the markets have responded to. Uh, we're seeing before they close. This is something that, uh, you know, it will impact consumers in a way that the president uh, can argue uh, helps them. And again, this is something that as he's really staring down the barrel of impeachment and these investigations on the Hill, uh, a strong story for him uh, in light of some of these tariffs and this trade war. Uh, and he's hoping he can continue this momentum. And we just saw the Dow Jones uh, just about to close up uh, almost uh, over 300 points there on this day. They had already anticipated some good news. The president hinted at it yesterday. If you're just joining us, some breaking news from the White House. The president has announced a partial trade deal with China. We understand, Ben, that this covers uh, some of the big sticking points in these negotiations. Intellectual property, the forced transfer uh, of technology to Chinese companies, which had been a huge objection for the Americans. Also, uh, some uh, terms on current currency manipulation. Uh, the president says that 40 to 50, 000, 50 billion dollars of agricultural products uh, will be purchased by China from the United States. Of course, uh, a lot of uh, the fine print still needs to be seen here, Ben. Exactly. And uh, as with any anything that comes out of the White House, you have, really have to see what's put to paper uh, and when that happens uh, beyond what the president says. But if these details are, are and what he's saying today uh, turn out to be this, the start of a deal, uh, a very strong, positive uh, story for him to tell uh, to voters and also to some of his core constituencies. You see farmers uh, would be positively impacted there uh, and also uh, American manufacturers and, and companies wanting to protect their intellectual property and trade rights. And he's headed to Louisiana tonight for a campaign rally, so expect this will be one of the topics there. Ben Siegel for us at the White House. Thanks so much for your reporting, Ben. Thanks for joining us here in the briefing room on this Friday. We're here every day at 3.30, 5.30, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ABC News Live. You can download the ABC News app, follow the latest on all the stories we've talked about today there. Great ABC News reporting. And, of course, the live button at the bottom of that app. You can watch us right there. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week.